The East African tradition of the Maasai tribe is to greet one another with the words Kasirian and Gera, which is Swahili for, so how are the children? In that community, the well-being of their children is the highest priority. If you are interested in participating in thought-provoking conversations about the well-being of children and families, please tune in every Wednesday at 3 p.m. to Fresh Start Today on 860 AM WNOV. Together, we can save our children. Good afternoon. You're listening to Fresh Start Today with your host, uh, Jermaine Reed and Sean Roby. Uh, we have in the studio with us two uh Behavioral health specialists, mental health professionals, we have um, from the Shorehaven Behavioral Health Clinic, we have Kristen Belkofer. She is an in home psychotherapist, and we have psychologist Dr. Ben Radar from Sebastian Family Psychology Practice. And so we're going to have a really great conversation around children, youth, and food hoarding, or some people call it food insecurity. We have the great engineer himself, Mr. Keon, in the house today. How are you doing, Keon? All right, and we have our videographer, Mr. Tony Cash. So we're going to have a great conversation. And um, throughout the next hour, if you would like to join this conversation, or if you have some specific questions for our guests, Kristen Belkofer and Dr. Ben Rader, please feel free to call 414-444-5250. 414-444-5250. I'm going to get to a few community announcements before we jump into this conversation. Um, I found out today that there will be a summit on poverty that's hosted by the Social Development Commission on August 2nd, 2016. And it's my understanding that the phenomenal keynote speaker will be Dr. Joy DeGru. I didn't know about this. And she wrote uh, the book called um, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And if you are interested in, you know, wow, and this is also free and open to the public, so we really should have a packed house. It's going to be at the Italian Community Center August the 2nd from 7.30 a.m. until 2 p.m. Uh, the contact is Diane Robinson at 414-906-2700, 414-906-2700. Again, that's SDC's Dismantling Poverty. Uh, there's Summit on Poverty with the guest, Dr. Joy DeGroom. We also know that the Partnership Council meeting is coming up Friday, July the 29th from 12 o'clock to 2 p.m. It's going to be held at the Division of Milwaukee Child Protective Services, which is located at 635 North 26th Street right here in the city of Milwaukee, a great city by a great lake with a whole bunch of great people. And you can call the division over at 414-343-5500 if you're interested in attending the Partnership Council, one of the most important community meetings that's hosted by um, the division that you all can participate in. Also, we'll be giving away a few um, a few um, tickets to State Fair on today's show, so you'll have to answer a question of some sort and then be calling number five, and you can win two tickets to the State Fair. Again, if you'd like to join this conversation today with Dr. Ben Rader and Kristen Belkofer, myself and Sean Roby, talking about children, youth, and Food hoarding, you can call us at 414-444-5250. So, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. afternoon, good afternoon. So, listen, I want you all to take a minute to introduce yourselves and kind of talk about what your practice is or the focus of your practice, how long you've been providing mental health services, to which population, and uh, where you work, and we'll go from there. Great. You want to start with me? Oh, sure. Kristen, so go I'm ahead. I'm Kristen Belkofer, and I work for Shorehaven Behavioral Health. And I um, am part of the in-home program there. So okay. I'm a, a psychotherapist, and I do in-home therapy, with, which essentially means that we work with kids, adolescents, and their families uh, for about, about one year of services. And we do some pretty intensive therapy with them during that time. Um, so sometimes that can be for up to four hours a week, depending on, you know, different insurance and things like that and different symptoms. What, what kind of insurance do you all take? Uh, we take all of the different um, state insurances okay. um, and some other um, commercial insurance as well. So. Blue Cross Blue Shield? Mm -hmm. Anthem? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So great. Um, title 19. Check in. <laughs> okay. I'm not so much on the billing end of things. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> so but if people want, want to find out about it after they listen to our discussion, they can call 414-542-170. We'll give that yeah, number out most again. definitely. And it depends um, on the provider. So gotcha. the provider is sort of the person that needs to be credentialed by each of these different insurances. But for the most 
most part, the kids that we work with meet uh, criteria for severely emotional disturbance through, in the eyes of Wisconsin State Insurance. Got you. Um, most of these kids have been um, inpatient at one point um, with a lot of suicidal uh, ideation, things like that. So some pretty severe mental health um, situations when we're coming when we're looking at the little kids we're seeing a lot of violence aggression things like that and so um, the in-home program was sort of developed in a way to be sort of this um, the next sort of logical step because at one point you know these kids were going inpatient and um, then being discharged back out into the community to do you know outpatient therapy once a week maybe every other week and they were finding that of course that really wasn't you know meeting the the mental health needs that they had so we're kind of the go-between and we do a lot of work with the families as well in this, so, in this position thanks a lot Kristen. now what about you dr ben i'm a psychologist at a sebastian family psychology practice primarily and we work with uh, again a lot of high need families uh, through the wraparound program i'm in the homes quite a bit i do psychological assessment i also consult with mental health teams and for social service agencies i also have a thing that i do with uh the Wisconsin Psychological Association, I am the public education coordinator. So part of my my job is actually just to do this, okay. to go out in the community and teach community about yes. mental health and wellness. So I'm kind of wearing two hats today. Well, I appreciate you both being here, taking time out of your busy schedule to bring awareness to this very important issue. And um, um, in our conversation today on children, youth, and food hoarding, hopefully you'll be able to help us understand exactly what is food hoarding or insecurity understand the contributing factors or causal factors in children and adults hoarding is there mm-hmm. is there a difference you know in terms of what those behaviors look like or even contributing factors yeah. um, we also would like to understand what is emotional what is our emotional attachment to food mm-hmm. you know <laughs> and finally for those family members who suspect that maybe um, someone they know be it a child youth or adult may have an eating disorder or problem, where can they go to get help? So again, for those who are listening out there in our classroom and you would like to join um, this discussion, you can call 414-444-5250. There's a lot of hungry kids in the world, um, not just overseas and in third world countries, but right here in zip codes 532106, 532112, 532209, 5310, 5315, 14, 17, <laughs> mm-hmm. 531. 08 and 0188 and all these other zip codes. Yeah. People are just hungry and um, and particularly in communities where there's a lot of food deserts and poverty rates are very high. There are a number of children who are going hungry. And even when you have summer programming um, where organizations and businesses are giving away food, you know, um, through their summer rec programs, what have you, the reality is there's a lot of folks who are hungry. Um, When we talk about food insecurity, can you really kind of talk about what is that? Sure. Um, So food insecurity is sort of the way that we measure a person's, um, and I like to use the word perception because I think that that's important too. Okay. Um, Their perception and their ability to feel that they can get their basic food needs met. Okay. So I like to think of food security or food insecurity as sort of like being on a spectrum, right? It's not that you're 100% 100% food insecure or 100% food secure, it kind right. of can oscillate and you know be on different p- parts of the spectrum depending on uh, the situation. And when I think about food insecurity and food security, I think a lot about looking at it from like an ecological perspective. So okay. what I mean by that is that there's a lot of factors that, that go into that. And I love that you brought up right away the issue of food deserts and um, community food shortage okay. and access to healthy food in the community because that's definitely one of the bigger sort of macro level pieces that we see a lot working with our families of, you know, we, we want to eat healthier. We want to have, you know, more access to more food. We want to find different resources, but we don't know where to go. And I think, um, and I wonder if you can relate mm-hmm. to this too, and that we both work in the community. Um, yeah, we, we are in the community seeing that there are really limited access um, to these different types of healthy eating resources and different types of healthy eating messages. Okay. You know, you just drive through the community and there's signs for fast food everywhere. And there's, you know, some really, uh, you know, not so healthy food ad- advertisements. So you've got that kind of big picture stuff. And then you've got the, the situation with the child themselves, whether they had experienced neglect or abuse and, um, you know, hunger very early in life, which, as we know, can, can do a lot to their neuro- neurological and biological development. 
and their families and sort of their family food culture and how that looks now. So there's a lot of factors. So it's a hard thing to measure. So when you talk about this food deprivation mm-hmm. or the type of food patterns or behavior that folks have, um, infants, so are you saying that that can impact their neurological development, if I heard you? And, and can you elaborate on that a little bit, if you can? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Sure. So you really think about us as a, as a bio, uh, we're a biological thing. We're like uh, any, anything else in nature. Mm-hmm. We, we uh, grow because we're getting the nourishment. We talked about this last, uh, last time I was on the show, so the idea of we're, we're, we're growing at all times in an environment where we're either getting what we need or we don't get what we need. And biologically, if a child doesn't get what they need uh, regularly, it puts the their system on a constant sense of distress, that you're physically needing to get more food. And imagine uh, a, a, an infant who, for whatever reason, is laying in its crib and unable to get that nourishment and is essentially starving or malnourished mm. in that mm-hmm. mindset in that time. time is period. that the failure to thrive that you're referencing now, well, or is that something fa- failure, different? Failure to thrive can happen usually more on an emotional level. So when you okay. hear that term, Sean, I keep uh, turning it back to you. No, it's fine. But, Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> failure to thrive usually happens more on an emotional level. And what I'm talking about is just at a biological level, more uh, with regards to getting the food that I need in my body, if it's not going to mm-hmm. come, that puts my, sense in a, my, my body in a complete sense of distress. Now, when I get the nourishment, because it wasn't coming in regularly, right. okay. my body's going to try to hold on to that mm-hmm. as much as it possibly can for mm-hmm. as, as long as it can. And the, mm-hmm. and the body starts metabolizing food and storing it. You're not only hoarding it later on in life to keep it, but you're physically hoarding it every calorie you get in your body so early basically in your life. body goes into a survival S- mode. Survival mode. Yeah, yeah. that's, survival the, that's mode. where we we're all we're, 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 we're we're groomed to survive, or we're, right. uh, we're, we're, we're designed instinct. to survive. It's yeah. part of our instinct. natural yeah. so a little. I mean, we're talking a little baby now. So maybe at, uh, something goofy is happening with a family for the first two years of life, and during that time the child's not getting food. Already innately in it, it's got a strange relationship with food, a need for food, and constantly maybe more food than what other people uh, get before it satiates and feels like mm-hmm. I have to get everything I can when I right. get it. Uh, at all times, and biologically, it imprints, and the metabolism starts mm-hmm. changing even at that young age, so that I want to hold on to as much food as I possibly can when I get it. Right. So let's look at a uh, an adult population versus a non-adult population when it comes to food security. You've kind of talked about trauma being a contributing factor um, in the form of neglect and or abuse, mm-hmm. um, but are there any other factors that? either are the same or different when we look at adult versus child population who are dealing with food insecurity? I, I find that to be true in some, in some situations, that there are some differences. Okay. I think there's some similarities and some differences. Um, and I feel like, once again, I'm going to use that term spectrum, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that I feel like um, what Dr. Ben was just talking about was a lot of those um, sort of physiological things related to, like, really early in life for mm-hmm. the younger kids. And um, a lot of, like, our work is coming in, you know, on a more, uh, you know, trying to help those things prevent that situation from getting worse and, you okay. know, emotionally more damaging, right, and kind of teaching some healthy things. So I guess uh, some of the things I see happen as, like, the lifespan goes on, that sort of thing. I definitely work with a lot of, like, adolescents and have have worked with adults that also do, you know, food hoarding, stealing, Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of other kind of disordered food behaviors, whatever they may be. And there's some, yeah, there's some really interesting dynamics that go on there. One thing that I've found is that um, a lot of sort of binge eating and things like that has a similar function almost to like self-injury. Okay. Um, so that's sort of like filling the hole, filling the empty kind of feeling. Um, Emotional eating. and that's well, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So, so is food hoarding just all about food or lack of food? Or is there an emotional void that's going on and you're trying to replace food with, you, you know. I, I would agree. <laughs> I think it's both. So, And, and sometimes it's even uh, beyond emotional. So we, 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 we'll we see in, in uh, – Food hoarding itself is not a diagnosis. Right. You don't have the DSM you open up that's a big fancy book we have to diagnose things. Nothing in there mm-hmm. that says food hoarding. But uh, people who are obsessive compulsive will sometimes hoard. People with reactive attachment disorder. Now, this is coming from a deep uh, ex- a deep 
abandonment issues right. and, and neglect issues, and, and these are this is really hard to manage. And, okay. You know, yeah. Children dying, diagnosed with that, this is really a hard thing to manage. Then you have uh, later in life adults. Think about all of us as adults when we're stressed out. We may have been uh, getting plenty of food in, in life growing up and never been without it, but we, we can't eat enough when we're stressed out, and that's because there's a comfort eating that's aspect right. of food. Mm-hmm. And now there's another thing that happens that we didn't uh, – that, that that I don't hear anybody talk about, but with psychotic processing, people have schizophrenia okay. or so forth, yeah. there's often the sense that my very reality is fractured and doesn't make sense, and they'll hoard all sorts of odd things, food being one of them, mm-hmm. uh, because, again, there's a sense of insecurity. I'm, I'm never – and I feel at risk at all times, and I have to – so so there's different processes by which we experience food hoarding and different reasons people for whom – and usually these are based in an emotional – a deep emotional need. It's not a logical or rational right. thing, which means it doesn't easily extinguish with just – giving a set of consequences or something, right. expecting it's going to go away because that emotional need, if it's not met, is still going to continue right. to gnaw at the, yeah. at the individual. Especially with the kids when they don't have, you know, that frontal brain development yet mm-hmm. to, like, put words to even What they're feelings. needing even. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, and absolutely. I think to add to that, when you even look at an infant and you talk about the emotional connection, when we talk mm-hmm. about attachment in itself, uh, a child is fed by a caregiver. So if that child is not being fed by a caregiver got, consistently, yes, yes, that's right. my sense that's right. of survival is going to kick in even higher. So I may start looking around and uh, sucking on my toes, my yeah, thumb, right. a blanket, right. something to soothe me exactly. in the interim until I am able to get some type of true nutrients. Yes. For those of you who are just tuning in, you're listening to Fresh Start Today with your host, Jermaine Reed and Sean Roby. We have special guests in the studio, Kristen Bell Kofer. And we have Dr. Ben Rader. And we also have on the phone line our very fresh special friend, right. JT. Good <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> How you doing, Mr. Jermaine I'm, Reed? Man, I'm cool <laughs> now. I got you on the phone. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for having an excellent show. Thank you. And, and good afternoon to your special boom Yes, good uh, afternoon, Good afternoon. JT. Good afternoon to all of you. Only thing I have to, to say or everything you just said about nutrition and, and uh, people getting a proper diet and stuff like that. I was, I remember when I was a small child, my parents had jobs working here in the community mm-hmm. not that long ago uh, at the factories, stuff at Ale Smith and whatever the case may be. There was grocery stores around the community mm-hmm. that provided nutrition food. I'm not talking about canned foods or anything like that. I'm talk- they have a lot of preservatives in it and stuff like that. Right. They used to be real food. Right. So so when those uh, factories went overseas, it was outsourced and stuff like that. Mm. So they go to grocery stores. So what's happening in our community is it's very hard to get and to eat nutritionally because, you know, you go to a store now, it's going to be organic. Mm-hmm. natural, or anything like that. But what can you actually do on that? Cause, uh, and especially you doctors that's there today, my uh, Jermaine Reed, honorable guest, excuse me, doctors, <laughs> my, my question is, where can, what can you do when, you, when nutrition is very important to anybody community you know, to be nutritious and be stabilized. If you can't get it, if it's going to cost you a lot of money, yeah, yeah. And stuff, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say? Got you. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, yeah. JT, for tuning in. We'll get that question answered. Yeah, you know, the first thing that I'm hearing with JT asking this question, he's, first of all, he's spot on. And we've talked about food, food deserts and the people that need the food the most have the less access to right, it. Right. And you go to neighborhoods where everybody's well-fed and there's many options. Right. Uh, I, I do want to put in a plug for Will Allen and Growing Power because this is something that if people aren't aware of, uh, Will Allen's growing food urban uh, in urban settings right. and giving the food away virtually for free. Now, now I know uh, there's still a huge uh, cavity that's not being filled, but I do think uh, being aware of those resources at Fondy Farms, uh, there's places where, where you can get it and it's manageable. And sometimes uh, the issue isn't just lack of access, but it's lack of exposure. So right. you, may have, uh, you may have access to Fondi Farms, but if I grew up 
eating uh, ding dongs and Hostess products because right. they were convenient mm-hmm. and what we have. I don't. I'm going to turn my nose up. So you know, there's a, there's a, there's a growth and an education Absolutely. curve here yeah. that we have to get people used to this idea. But he's talking about a huge I- I matter that that none of us can can solve without a changing in the economic situation in America. And we are dealing with a poverty issue here. Uh, and to say that mental health is going to solve it, it would be nice for mental health to go out of business because people are getting their needs met in right. in, in, right. Uh, in right. healthy communities. But uh, I, when, unfortunately, we're in a position where there continue to be food scarcity, and, and that's a reality. It's lived out in living rooms, bedrooms, and right. uh, 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 halfway houses across America. People that need it the most are are without without uh, ability to get uh, to get access to the stuff that they're that they're gonna could make them healthy. Yeah, gotcha. Absolutely. Now, now, Dr. Ben, you were talking about how that hoarding is not a formal diagnosis, but more so a symptom of some other things like right. reactive attachment disorder, schizophrenia. Um, what were some of the others? Uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. Obsessive compulsive is disorder. Is most we also see it in autism and development. Yeah, autistic R- children do this sometimes. Mm-hmm. So it's you know it's yeah. not even. And how does that look? I mean, and, and particularly for a parent who has an autistic child, what should we be looking for? Yeah. So in those type of situations, um, those are a lot of the times the what's going on with the root of the issue is some really deep seated anxiety and sort of the kids. Having food and having access to food and that perceived access to food, right? Feeling like you are always capable of being able to help yourself survive, that is um, that can create a lot of anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. So um, we see kids, you know, in all different, with all different um, diagnoses from autism to OCD, things like that, where th- doing things like hoarding or collecting, organizing, things like that actually helps them organize and regulate their emotions, sort of that inner experience that's going on. Sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with food at all, right? Sometimes it does. Um, Some, we, especially with some of the um, children I've worked with in the autistic community, um, there can be uh, some really interesting, you know, sensory issues related to food where they become uh, very picky or, you know, Uh they're sort of specific about what they can eat due to sensory issues. That that brings on a whole other, you know, level, absolutely, a whole other level of, you know, sort of stress and, and specific, you know, person-centered management for the parents right. and the family. But we all have a, a eating, what you want to say, um, habit or a way, a, a style of how we eat Absolutely. or a way that we eat, yep. and it varies from person to person. But um, l- let me ask you this question. Uh, well, let me go back. I want to just kind of review. So in children, food hoarding can take place in a vari- for a variety of reasons. Uh-huh. And we've talked about neglect, deprivation, but chaotic or disruptive home environments, how does that lend to eating problems and particularly hoarding? Right. So if you're in a home and there's a constant possibility that something's going to go down or you've got that sense everybody's walking on eggshells. Right. right. Uh, having food to comfort us, it almost lulls Absolutely. us into a, a place of uh, I'm going to be all right. There's mm-hmm. an emotional rela- – Sean brought something up a moment ago. My mind's still kind of on it because it's really true and the idea is this. Uh, idea of nurturance, of being breastfed, okay, being and that's also being cared for by another. You're being nurtured, okay. And human there's this contact. Human contact. Mm-hmm. So what am I starving for? It might not be that I'm starving for food, right. but I'm starving for something. And I'm not going to get it here, okay. So I'm going to eat some more because it's cause and it's so the closest that, feeling that I have biologically. It's a very similar thing. Right, you know? right. So if that mother. Um, who's breastfeeding the child is under an enormous amount of stress, it could impact it. her Absolutely. ability to lactate? That's true. Absolutely. Okay. Which, okay. Absolutely. And, and okay. I'm not Absolutely. even thinking more of as a metaphor. Mother is nurturing. So Absolutely. later on, she, she may find, he may find that I need to be nurtured, and no one's nurturing me. But the closest thing in, deep down in our primal self is a sense that when I'm eating, when I'm consuming, I'm being cared for. And that, I think, is what's getting triggered yeah, in the, right. in the yeah. domestic violence kind of situation. Absolutely. And what I kind of wanted to riff off of what you just said was, um, you know, sometimes you'll be, we'll see, the, like you said, people, um, they're just eating for that comfort, right? Well, what kind of foods are people usually likely to go right. for? It's the quick stuff. stuff. It's the junk food. Yeah, oh, it's right. the quick so stuff. So are, are, are there that's some, right. when you're dealing with an eating problem or eating disorder like um, hoarding, mm-hmm. and I, I want to be careful because it's not a diagnosis, yeah. you know, yeah. but yeah. this eating pattern right are there some no eating zones are there places that you should try how do you uh-huh. y- yeah uh-huh. <laughs> well i would like i'd recommend in general i think uh, when, when when we're looking at 
food food hygiene or whatever. There's okay. A, the, the notion of um, having small, frequent meals is actually a little bit more what we need. We, we think of, I think, society as kind of three big meals a day. Yeah. But if you think of like in daycares and so, so, so forth, there's actually times when you're eating, there's snack time or whatever. And that's right. kind of built in. So you actually want to kind of pepper eating throughout the day and not have it just be so you're waiting and waiting and waiting. It's right. going to happen a little bit more frequently and maybe smaller meals. And I think location of food, um, it becomes important when people are hoarding because what happens is they take it from what's the common area to the private area so that they can mm-hmm. have it and keep it. So yeah. they tend to know that this, this should be eaten in the kitchen or whatever, but if I put it in the kitchen or it stays in the cupboard, someone else is going to eat it. Right. So right. it's never a logical thing where there, there's, you know, th- now there's also the idea too, I think that sometimes people just eat everywhere and all the time. And I think mm-hmm. having a specific time and place and routines around eating uh, certainly helps. And you're, you know, we're going to eat at the table, we're going to have food together at the table, and then we're going to, and maybe right. even have shared food at the table, we're going to share it together, and yeah. then you put it, take it away together. Or, or some good eating hygiene patterns. Well, thanks a lot. Well, we're about to take a break in a minute, um, and you're listening to Jermaine Reed, Sean Roby on Fresh Start today, and we're talking about foster children, uh, children, youth, and food hoarding. And we'll be right back after this brief break. This is Jermaine reporting from Fresh Starts WBCM, Wisconsin Black Children Matter. Did you know that the number of black children in Milwaukee's foster care community continues to rise? According to the Department of Children and Families' most recent annual report, black children made up 68.2% of Milwaukee's foster kids. Many of these children are not only removed from their family and siblings, but are placed in families and communities that do not reflect or honor their race, culture, or heritage. Fresh Start is an agency that is committed to serving and advocating for black children. In order to meet the needs of this growing population, we need more black families in the Milwaukee area that love and celebrate black children. To become a licensed, culturally responsive foster parent with Fresh Start, you must be 21 years old, married or single with a stable income, clear several criminal background checks, and complete 36 hours of pre-licensing training. To learn more about other qualifications, call 414-351-1100. That's 414-351-1100. Again, this is Jermaine reporting from Fresh Start, WBCM, Wisconsin Black Children Matter. Do you know what Nelson Mandela, Andrew Jackson, Malcolm X, and Steve Jobs have in common? Each of these individuals were world leaders who were once in foster care. We often hear about the road from foster care to prison, but did you know there's another road from foster care to a world stage? Fresh Start Family Services is looking for adults to become licensed foster parents. Every child needs a caring adult in their lives. Wouldn't it be great if you could foster or adopt the next world leader? For more information on how you can become licensed with Fresh Start, please call 414-351-1100. That is 351-1100. All right, good afternoon. We're down for the last half of this program today. We're talking about children, youth, and food hoarding with our special guest, Dr. Ben Radar from Sebastian Family Psychology Practice and Kristen Belcofer from Shorehaven Behavioral Health. And we've had a great conversation. If you would like to join this conversation, you have some specific questions about food hoarding or insecurity, please feel free to call 414-444-5250. So, so Dr. Ben and Kristen, can you kind of talk about how um, a caregiver or birth parent might determine whether a child's Hoarding might be a sign of a psychiatric problem or whether it's more related to um, survival behavior. Yeah, that's a really good point. I like that you said that whether it's re- related to survival behavior, right? Okay, the root, yeah. So, yeah, so we work with a lot of kids that have some pretty deep attachment issues uh, that make it very difficult for them to, to feel safe and secure in most of their basic needs, including okay. food, right? And uh, it's a little bit tricky to, you know, determine what behaviors are are healthy, what are normal, what are not so normal, what might need some more help. Um, one of the things that um, Dr. Ben said a little earlier is he mentioned that, you know, there are certain cases where like your typical behavior modification kind of strategies, like they kind of don't work <laughs> in this type of okay. situation. Okay. And I think that when you start getting into a situation where you are encountering a child um, repeating these behaviors over and over again, like stealing food, hoarding food, and you see a lot of anxiety and shame in response to that. Um, it can be very difficult to meet them in sort of a logical kind of way okay. around this. Of course, there's, um, once again, there are times when 
I mean, I think I'm guilty of stealing cookies and things okay. from. You stole you know, cookies? I did. <laughs> <laughs> or being like, I don't want this because I don't want my, you know, somebody else in my family to get it, right? So, you know, one or two times, things like that, where it's, um, you know, the, the child can be sort of disciplined in the typical way that they're disciplined, and it doesn't cause this, like, you know, enormous shame. Uh, guilt, anxiety type of response. But when you start to see that shame, anxiety, guilt sort of thing kick in with that real compulsion, okay. um, and it's happening over and over again, and you're seeing other food-related behaviors that you're, you're not feeling so great about or that you're questioning, I think that's usually the time when it's, it's good to reach out to you know, people. You in should say shame and, shame and guilt. It could also be anger, though. So Absolutely. sometimes people, right. they'll express that shame and guilt, and they'll, you're yelling and hollering, and it's, and it's just a whole, you know, laden with emotion but a, pro, a strong emotional response yeah, whenever suggests there's that an emotional root emotional response now, now I'm glad we're talking about this behavior modification piece now you said something we're going to go back to that word stole cookies and we'll deal with stole mm-hmm. or stolen in a minute um, but some foster children particularly probably would agree with this statement that um, their abuse that through their abuse that they learn many things can be used as a tool in abusing or neglecting for yes. example Parents can be yeah. very materialistic and use clothing as a punishment and say mm-hmm. something to the fact of, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to allow you to wear this particular outfit that I gave you or these shoes I'm going to take back from you. There's other things that can also be used as tools of discipline or punishment. Absolutely. Shelter mm-hmm. is one. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to put you out, you know, because of your behaviors or whatever. You're not going to be right. able to live here. We, we get those notices. Right. We get folks who say these things, yeah. you know. Um, but another big piece is also food, that yeah. sometimes children can be sent to bed, mm-hmm. you know, food. without mm-hmm. food. Or um, you know that the child doesn't like a certain type of food or this is what we have and you go eat what we have and then that's it. So, right. you know, um, so is it possible that sometimes as foster parents we really don't understand um, the dynamic of food hoarding and how it impacts children's lives and how they manifest that? Is that possible? And yeah, I would I would say so. I think that, and I wouldn't say that we wouldn't lay this on foster parents' ineptitudes. This is mm-hmm. all I think adults, even professionals. Absolutely. I've had I had teachers do similar things. You know, that suspending somebody or, or making them so they can't eat their lunch at lunchtime yeah. or something. You know, so uh, 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 many uh, are guilty, and the idea is we really, really have I'm- to think of food as not something that you're going to control. Uh, it's it fools a source of nurturance, and it's about healthy living. So it it should really be dis, uh, dismantled from a discussion about behavior and conduct. Because okay. there's, there's really no logical relationship between me eating food and me uh, me having good conduct or bad conduct. Absolutely, and I really like that the whole idea of like you know we want to teach that this is not like a food is not a privilege to be taken away, right? It's okay, it's a basic need. need. It's right. a basic need. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the kids we work with are, you know, they're on medications, right? right. And they develop a conceptualization over time that That's right. I need these medications to feel well. Well, we wouldn't take away food, you know, and say that you're still going to be well. Mm-hmm. You but also, also need food or, some food, well. or some of those food or some of those medications will increase, increase the appetite, appetite right. or decreases right. yeah, that right. appetite. So, right. so, so when we talk about this and you're talking about not using food as a discipline tool or a tool of discipline, we also have to look at, and the reason why I'm talking about foster parents in this particular example, because we've had foster parents yeah. who say something to the effect of, um, I want to put a lock on my refrigerator. I want to put a lock on my cabinets. I want to yeah. put a lock yeah. on the kitchen door. I mean, what message is that sending, <laughs> sure. and how do we work through that? Sure. I- yeah. If you're ever stealing food, it's not yours. So if you think about that, de- that the depth of that c- scenario, if you're living as adults, we don't steal food. Right. We sneak food. We, 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 right. we break our diet. Okay. Uh, but we don't. We can't steal. So the idea is, is almost then the things that you need, the nurturance that you need, the things that you need to survive and thrive as a human being, and you're living in this home, that stuff doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. And you got to meet yeah. my standards in order you're going to before you're going to get the needs that you so want. So is there a yeah. control issue here going? Is there a control a, yeah, battle? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, yeah. and, and how do we break? Perhaps it didn't the, start yeah. that way, but that's that's the that's, that's what, what it comes down to. It's going to come down to Absolutely. right because in many in in the lenses of many providers, they may look at that as you're stealing, you're stealing from me, right. or you're stealing from the rest mm-hmm. of the family. Right. So now I need to modify you by holding it all back from you, and that again goes back to when we talk about the 
survival mode or what some call the reptilian brain. Yes. Yes. And with yes. that, yes. we yes. go right back into our initial motivations and needs where I don't care what you tell me, yeah. I'm going to get my need met. And that's I'm going to steal some pizza or if, I, if it's that's food right. in front of me, I'll still put Are we the stealing? pizza I, I wanna, I, We have to take a paradigm shift. Are we stealing food because right. you're hungry? Right. right. Are you stealing right. food right. or are you sneaking food or right. what are you doing exactly? Yeah, I, I love that. And it, I don't have a, a, a crisp answer. I think that's right. I think the, the, the question is how do we replace the word stealing? We right. should we yeah. should be reflecting on that and looking at it. And think about if you had a roommate. Mm-hmm. Is your roommate and he and and he or she had the, contributed to the mm-hmm. budget or whatever? Grocery you have you had, you had grocery list yeah. and shared groceries. They, we wouldn't see them as stealing food, and we would right. never take our roommate's food away from us. And mm-hmm. I, I think part of that comes down to the idea of there's a fundamental equality here. The idea that as human beings, we all this is your home, and I want you to feel like this is your home. And as you're as you're attempting to manage the youth's behavior, what you're really doing is unconsciously excluding them from the home right and they're not and they're feeling they're not a part of that home and it's not a collaborative it's right. not a collaborative kind of and so thing. now yeah. could ultimately lead to new behaviors or additional behaviors now because you're treating yeah. me like yeah. the outsider yeah. Yeah. so now there's, i may take it out on the other kids or there's you. another issue here that that i think is is more of a for my sam as a therapeutic kind of thing and that is uh, uh therapy uh, dinner is not a good time to lecture about things in general it's unfortunate yes. because oftentimes that's what the, that's the only time we talk is at dinner and then it's all negative but mm. you know if you got a, if you got the idea that 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 dinner is hands off everything at this point we're coming together as people we're eating together as people we're putting together the fight that we just have we're putting that aside mm-hmm. and we're just going to talk together we're going to be together now you have a, a everybody's got a respite in their day when the fight stops when nurturance happens, where family happens, mm-hmm. where belonging happens, and then, ironically, that's the time when the problems might actually start becoming solved. You know, uh, Auntie, I'm sorry the way I, I talked before. I'm not glad that it happened. But now, if you if you were punishing that kid and excluding them from dinner, you lost that opportunity right. to yeah. sit and just food break is, bread together. Yeah, right. Right. food is right. sacred. Right. Right. Food is sacred. Right. I mean, right. it'll, it'll put yeah. you in a state of uh, euphoria where you know what. <sighs> I can relax a little yeah, bit right. because you're taking care of yourself. You're taking exactly, care of yourself. You're that and someone's taking care of you. So Absolutely. we're talking yeah. about children, youth, and food hoarding on Fresh Start today. Is three forty one after the hour. We have a few more minutes on the program. If you'd like to join this conversation, if you have a question around food hoarding, please feel free to call four one four 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 five two five zero. 414-444-5250. In a few minutes, we're going to be giving away two tickets to the state fair. Um, Doctor Ben and Kristen, we're talking about how important dinner time is and eating with family and just having this time of respite where you just disengage from all your battles. You lay down your swords and your weapons and we just come together and break bread together and um, reframing this conversation or labeling, you know, um, not looking at this survival behavior as stealing because I'm thinking about some of the folks that we've had on the program, particularly a gentleman by the name of Tyrone. And he talked about how at six or seven years old, he had to go to the neighborhood gas station to take food. Yeah. Wow. Sure. And a lot of us were to survive, as, as to uh-huh. survive yeah. you know. Yeah. So is it really fair to say this child went to the corner store and stole this right. pack of hot right. dogs and bologna? Right. right. And then for us foster parents and caregivers, period, who may have a child or educator, who may have a child in your classroom who goes into the lunchroom and steal... Uh, there we go again, <laughs> who takes food yeah. out of somebody else's lunch right. bag right. or out of the refrigerator, because right. I've had that as a foster parent. Right. I would get calls from this school district, and they would call, and, and my foster sons, they were just eating everybody's food, <laughs> including their own, yeah. and that mm-hmm. created problems between yeah. the parents of those children, the school administration, and I can honestly say I didn't fully understand yeah. hoarding. You know, yeah, I was yeah. finding apples that were half eaten in the couch and so, in the pillows yeah. and the closet, and it was just everywhere, right. and they would never really go back mm-hmm. to the food. Right, You know, right, so, so right, what is, what right, is that? Right. I feel like what you're talking about relates to dignity a okay. lot. You know, that there's this idea that, uh, like, you know, even when you were describing, mm-hmm. like, having a more positive experience or, like, setting aside dinner time mm-hmm. as a sacred, like, positive experience, it really conveys a sense of dignity mm-hmm. and we can um and it, i think you know parents not not just foster parents but anybody um can uh sort of 
um, undermine that sense of dignity when it becomes like, you know, this is this is my food that I pay for, that yeah, kind of yeah. thing, which, which completely understand the frustration when you are finding things like apple cores in your couch. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, funds are limited and financial things are limited. I totally get that. It's incredibly frustrating. Um, I think one thing that's really good to remember about this is that we want to keep looking at the kids' adaptations to what they've experienced. So whether it be the trauma, the abuse, the neglect, right. we want to look at that as they're, they might have some undesired behaviors that we're seeing right okay. now, but ultimately it's a positive thing. The child's brain is amazing, okay. you know, how it can a- adapt to those sort of right. things. Okay. So it's been this like survival adaptation. I mean, we're actually like, it's actually a really positive thing that if we can reframe it, we can teach kids how to communicate their needs better, how to be more attuned to their body signals for food, yep. things like that. But it reminds me of you know what you were saying about your um, the other person who had to go to the gas station to get food. Mm-hmm. If you put a do- if you put a lock on the door, the kids will find a way to get whatever need it may be. If it's biological, if it's emotional, because their brains are wired to do so, right, and it's right. an amazing thing that they're wired to do so. Um, so oftentimes we're sort of leading them down a path that is not the best path for them, by, right? Mm-hmm. You know, being mm-hmm. restrictive yeah. in that in that way. And now I'm thinking of myself as a kind of kid that steals when all I'm doing is getting my food met. And now I'm going to start carrying over a lot of life. Steal that? Why don't I steal a bike? Okay. You know, so the That's notion right. they start be, they start getting yeah. framed in that way. I, uh, Kristen's talking about digging. I'm over here thinking about chipmunks because. I think of the, the 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 idea. Why do we hide little bits of food, and <laughs> and why why does why does it happen in nature? Because the winter's coming. Oh, the ant, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the chipmunks ant, and squirrels—they're going to hide the food. They're going to hold it. They're not going to eat it. They're going to maybe to munch it a little bit and then and gonna put eat it, it away. Yeah. So so the winter's coming. I think the idea is that there's an emotional winter coming to these to these oh, people wow. that That's are in a, a really foster cool home. Idea. I'm I'm here now. I'm here now with with Jermaine, and he's taking care of me. But there's an emotional winter coming, yeah. and I'm going to. So are they emotionally my, malnourished? I would say emotionally malnourished oh, frequently. Wow. Yeah, wow, yeah, wow, sure. wow. And it manifests into into food, which has nothing to do with maybe in in this scenario. You got plenty of food around you, but you're still hoarding food as if there's an emotional winter mm-hmm. coming. Wow, yeah. you know, so I think that, go- that yeah, and that goes back to that paradigm shift when we talk about providers have to look at things from a different lens because I'm if I'm always in survival mode, mm-hmm. you can make the best meals and cook seven days a week. However, I you still may find some cornbread in my pillowcase right. Right. or in the dresser, <laughs> right. and so right. we need to right. work through that together because a lot of providers get upset, and I don't want bugs in my home, etc., etc., etc. So That's it has sustainable. to be a team mm-hmm. process to work the through that. Collaborative approach. Let's make sure the bugs don't come in. Let's figure out. How right. to make that yeah. happen. And maybe we're cleaning the room once. And we're going to talk about that. Something. What are some things or tools oh, that we can give sure. to children Absolutely. to help address, you know, to to help them get to a healthier place in terms of dealing with their yeah. eating needs? Um, Call number five. If you can tell us how, what is the percentage of African American children who are in the local foster care community? The number of African American children who are represented in our local foster care community. You can win two tickets to the State Fair. Ron, you are on Fresh Start today. You have a question or a comment? I have a question and a comment. Um, I have custody of my nephew. I've been having custody of him since he was 17 and he's like 24 now and uh, I can't find a psych psychologist or a psychiatrist anywhere. I mean, I'll come out better probably finding a mermaid. No one will take him for some reason. It's really unfortunate. I mean, he, he has a cognitive uh, learning disability, uh, a whole bunch of more things to add on to that. And when it comes to food, he will eat all day if he didn't stop you. He would go to the bathroom, use the bathroom, and come back up and continue eating. Um I mean, would you guys see somebody for something like that, or? Well, I'll tell you what, Ron. If if you uh, after this, uh, after we're done the show here, if you want to make sure you get the, your number through to uh, Jermaine, well, we can we can uh, give you a call and uh, even help you. There, there there is there is help available. It it's probably accessible to your nephew, and I'll be happy to help you to to make it. It it, it is out there. One of the challenges though with twenty four year olds is. Uh, it's kind of like you know, are they ready for help? And and that that's a different variable altogether. But uh, I well, always he say has, he has like a, a eight year old mentality. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. got sure. it. Yep, you bet. You so bet. Ron, take this number down, and for those who are listening in the classroom, the other students, there is four one four two four seven zero eight zero one four one four two four seven zero eight 
1-800-273-0101. That's for Dr. Ben Rader at Sebastian Family Psychology Practice. Or give Kristen Bell Kofer a call at 414-540-2170. 414-540-2170. So, so we're having a really good discussion around children, youth, and food hoarding. Um, do we have caller number five yet? Nobody wants to go to the state fair. That's okay. That's cool. <laughs> and for those of you who didn't know, Coles Cares and Hunger Task Force have partnered to create Coles Serving Up Supper for Kids. Kids 18 and under can eat supper this summer at supervised locations like schools, parks, and community centers throughout Milwaukee. If you want to know where those locations are specifically, dial 211 or visit impactinc.org for meal times and locations closest to your zip code. Again, call 211 about Coles serving up supper for kids. So, children have, everybody has needs. Right. Um, food is very important. There are some things that we just absolutely need for survival. Air, water, food. Is that the, the top of that chain? Um. So we're going to continue this discussion in terms of how do we manage uh, these issues around food hoarding and food insecurity. We have a caller on Fresh Start today. Caller. Caller. Are you a winner? Call number five. Caller number five. Call back. Okay. Caller, you're listening to Fresh Start today. Do you, you have a question, comment, or you're responding to the quiz? Uh, Mr. J- Jermaine Reed. Yes. JT. JT. <laughs> I'm calling back. I, am I calling number five? <laughs> you call you you call you actually call number six, number five hung up. So so what's the answer, JT? Yes, sir. What's the answer? what was the question? No, um what is the percentage of African American children who are represented in our local foster care system? African American young kids that uh, go to the foster care system, probably 85%, I'm thinking. No, a little high, but thanks. Keep, keep listening, JT. Thank you. Caller. All right, my caller's not there, so you call 414-444-5250 if you know how many African-American children are represented in our local foster care community. So, so let's go back to this food hoarding. Um, why does food hoarding continue when the child is being properly cared mm-hmm. for and there is really apparently no reason to continue to hide food in the couch, behind the couch, under the couch, yep. in the pillowcase, mm-hmm. in the closet. Why? Well, I mean, there's a variety of reasons, but right away I think of sort of uh, the, the concept of brain development that happens for kids. Um, and I think over one of the breaks you mentioned the reptilian brain, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's just a good way that we can refer to sort of those lower parts of the brain that refer to survival, self-preservation, things like that. Okay, hold on. Caller, you're on Fresh Start today. How many African-American children are representing our local foster care system? 45%. No, my friend, I wish it was 45%. <laughs> Caller, you're listening to Fresh Start today. Uh, what is the number of African-American children who are representing our local foster care community? 70%. Really, really close. I almost want to give it to you, so you're going to have to call back. You're really close. What they say is getting hot. <laughs> so, so, so you say it could be some developmental issues, something's going on. Well, right. So think of, you know, what happens um, in that sort of trauma mindset when, okay. when, you know, neglect and abuse happen and that impacts a kid really early. Those really early memories get stored, you know, closer right. to that area of the brain than they do to this area of the brain. So is it possible to say that children never forget really? Is it just repressed, but it's there? Those memories, those experiences somehow is coded. It is programmed. I think they can be reprocessed. Okay, okay. And you can develop new narratives and new core beliefs and new connections to your emotions. Um, To say that they never forget, I don't know if I would feel strongly about saying that. But I think... You know, when this when this stuff happens, their kids' brains aren't developed in the way that you and I, is, you know, are, mm-hmm. where we can put gotcha. words to it and language to it and reason and rationality. There's okay. nothing there connected to that, right? Caller, you're listening to Fresh Start today. How many black children are in our local foster care community? Uh, 73%. Almost, my friend. I think that was around 2007, 2008 numbers. Mm. Caller, do you... Know the answer. How many African-American children are, lo- are represented in our local foster care system? 
65%. So y'all don't listen to my commercial. No, <laughs> but you're close. You're close. Very, Thank very you close. Me. And I'm so glad you're listening to the show. Caller, you're on Fresh Start today. Do you know how many black children are represented in our local foster care system? I do believe you said 62%. Uh, what did you say, sir? Turn your radio down. I, I've heard you say 62%. No, you, 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 you almost heard right, but no. But thank you. <laughs> So, so, so we, we have some things that um, memory it can be repressed or these experiences are repressed, but they may mm-hmm. not be um, forgotten is what, yeah. what I'm hearing. And it's going to take time for new connections to be made. So even if they're in, a, you know, a new caregiver's home where right. it's a more of a safe and secure base, right. it's going to take time and reprocessing either through therapy, through the relationship, through those kind of dinners and right. food relationships mm-hmm. that Ben was talking about. OK, so so call her. How many black children are in our local foster care system? 60%. Almost, my friend. I thought Almost. that was it. I thought that it was, was the it. pause. It got exciting. <laughs> Fresh Drum today, roll. how many uh, black children are in our local foster care system? Uh, 87%. You said 87? Yes. I hope it never gets that high, but thank you for listening. Um, caller, Fresh Start today, You, uh, how many black children are in our local foster care system? You know what? That would be progress, but it's not the answer. True. (laughs) So we have some work to do, Division, Milwaukee Child Protective Service, DCF, because people are calling out some phenomenal numbers, and we can get there. Together, we can do more. Mm -hmm. Um, So I want to talk about what should parents do if they suspect the child is hoarding? Who can they talk to? Where do they go? Sure. I think the first person to talk to is the child. So, you child, know, the, okay. the, the idea is uh, you, rather than thinking there's got to be professional discussion, uh, having a discussion, what's going on with this, or and being open and being curious about it is an important thing. And then after that, uh, almost any mental health uh, expert will be able to get you started going in the right direction. So um, you, you've got uh, com- master's level therapists, uh, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, uh, anybody who's treating behavioral issues and emotional issues as for a living will be able to get you pointed in the right direction. What about a pediatrician? Oh, a pediatrician, absolutely, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, sometimes the, the challenge with pediatricians is sometimes they, they'll be looking at the physical and medical side of things okay. and not necessarily be quick to, but saying, well, this is an odd thing and it's becoming a problem, and then they'll, they'll, they'll hip you to where you need to go. Okay, so we have a caller. Caller, caller can you tell me how many black children are in our local foster care system? Yes, sir. Ninety-five point one percent. You said ninety-five point one. Yes, sir. Let me tell you something. If it ever gets that high, we marching up and down Capitol <laughs> Drive, Wisconsin <laughs> Avenue, North Avenue, Center Street, but it's not that high. So hopefully, it'll never get that high. But thank you for listening to Fresh. Do you do you listen to the show often? He's gone already. <laughs> All right. So um, you know, I think while before we go into uh, another caller couple things that providers could do is one uh again like dr ben said have those conversations with the children uh keep healthy snacks out yeah. because sometimes kids like to just grab anything so if you got healthy snacks laying around they're more inclined to eat healthier then you can open the door and have conversations about why it's more important to eat these foods versus other foods can if you, you know desi- can you designate a drawer in the refrigerator with their name absolutely. on it and, you know, yeah. with absolutely. foods that they like that's a great idea you, absolutely that's but then you can idea. take it yeah. a step further and have like if a kid is uh you know they're going to do a lot of snacking uh help them or allow them to put certain snacks in like a Ziploc bag or something, and then they can store that and keep it with them because then it's not in the pillowcase, under the bed, in the closet. Snack pack. There you go. You get them participating in it. I really like that. Absolutely. Uh, Grocery shopping with Mm -hmm. the family, involving them in that process. And the other thing that I had uh, done once is the family – uh, youth was eating too much of the of the family's dinner. Uh, they would have casseroles and so forth, and the, the, this this girl heaping things, and nobody else would eat. But yeah. she also was cared about fairness. Okay, so okay. they made ah, her right. dish out everybody's food. There you go. And that, she was, and great, then she great, was great, made great. sure that she had no more food than anybody else. Where she just, if it's all fend for yourself, you're going to take as much Absolutely. as you can get. Well, if you know, feed one another. You're going to be more. All fair things about do it. come to an end at some point. Caller, you're listening. Fresh start this today. Do you know this how many winner. black children are in our local foster care system? Drum roll. See, see, somebody's Woo! going to the state. Yeah! Congratulations. We'll get your information. Is this your first time listening to Fresh Start today? No. I'll oh. listen to you every week. 
Hey, oh, thanks great. a lot, man. Thank you. Well, well, congratulations on winning two tickets. Key on and get your information, and we'll be in contact. We'll leave the tickets right here at WNOV, the voice, for you to pick up. But let me let me say this one thing in terms of thank you for calling. Um, but folks can also plan consistent meals so your foster child or child becomes accustomed to eating at certain times. Routine, yes. This will build the trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, and give them, what, a healthy attitude towards food. Um, if you have to correct the child for bad behavior, try not to use food. Food should only be used to develop trust and care right. and not destroy it. Foster and Adoptive Family Services offers a course on healthy eating called Chew on This, a guide to diet and nutrition. Huh. That is Foster and Adoptive Family That's Services. Awesome. You can look them up online. It has been a great conversation um, I don't know. I don't think I have a caller, and we're about to leave for the day. And it's been great talking to you all. We'll be back next week with special guests. Um, thank you, Dr. Ben Rader, and yes. thank you, Kristen Colfort. Please don't allow this, Bell Colfort, don't allow this to be the last time that you all come and instruct us in Fresh Start Today's Classroom. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Have a great day. Until next week, be well, be safe.